Okay. Good day, everyone. Um, welcome all to this session. Um, it's the second session for the GDSC UI. Um, and GDSC, for those that do not really know it, is um, Google's Developer Student Club um, for University of Ibadan Chapter. So my name is Abib. I'm the current technical lead for um, this administration, and I welcome everyone on board. Um, thank you for taking um, your time to join us on this call. Um, so, um, as we are all aware of the sessions um, team, which is um, open source and it does is basically open source, and um, how to like get started, um, how to like make the best use of open source. We have invited three different speakers on um, different subject matters to like shed more light on this um, regarding their experience um, in the open source space. Um, yeah, and um, before we go on as well, um, for those that are, do not really know much about open source or what open source is, um, open source is um, any project uh, or library or, or project or software in short, um, whose um, source or code is open and made to the public. Yeah, and by the end of this session, we should, um, each and every one of us would um, definitely gain um, so many things in open source and also like, make use of the best use of it. And we have our first um, speaker on call, as well as our other speakers as well. Um, our first speaker is um, in person of um, Mr. Gbadibo Bilo. Um, one second, please. Hi everyone, um, I'm Dibo, um, but you can call me Dibo. Uh, I work as a developer relations engineer with a company called Postman. And um, open source is something that I'm really, open source and community generally, something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I have been privileged to have contributed to open source in the past. And open source in a way has helped me um shaped my career path and really contributed immensely to my growth one way or the other and it's really a privilege to be here with everyone today talking about open source and just getting to learn from the other speakers as well and sharing knowledge um thank you very much um Debo, for the intro um yeah you can i'm um, get started with your um session please Um, you are you are currently mute, Debo, please. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't realize I was muted. Yeah. So I was I was saying I do not have like a slide prepared, but I'm just going to walk through the guide that um, Adib shared with me earlier on, and use that slide. Okay, Esther, can you please go ahead? I can see your hand first. Okay, so um, I've already walked through what open source is, and really we've all benefited from open source one way or the other. Either we agree to it or not, because everyone has used one form of software. If you're, in fact, if you have a smartphone, you've used an open source software before, because either it's an Android smartphone or an iOS or an Apple device or whatever. If you've interacted with any modern day technology, you've ever loaded a website, you've one way or the other benefited from open source. So open source really is just, um, I see it as a way of people coming together to contribute to something of value. Um, like Abib mentioned, if there's like a project and um, the source code is openly available on the internet for you to access, um, it means that you can help improve the different softwares and libraries that you make use of in your day-to-day -day usage. And it doesn't mean, it, it doesn't just mean you can help improve it. It means you could also learn from how it was built. So imagine um, there's this library that you've been 
using it, your project and you've been wondering how it was built and then figured out that it was open source and then you can go to something called a repository which is the home for open source project and just learn how it was built out the different parts of the software connect to each other and then if you're using it and you feel like this thing has certain limitations and it has certain features that are missing you could also make contributions to that project and help improve it. So now imagine a project used by a thousand people or one used by hundreds of thousands of people, and then you figure that you had a limitation and you so something that you experienced personally, and you make something called a pull request, which is basically you making a contribution to that project and help making it better. Um, so one question I often get should be would be why should I really care about open source right since there's already a lot of people doing about and since there's already a lot of people doing open source and the thing is a lot of the times you probably would not get paid for contributing to open source right a lot of people are contributing their free time trying to improve different softwares I believe the most of the most popular open source project currently is Linux um, if you go to GitHub, Linux is probably the project that has like the most stars on GitHub. And Linux would probably not be where it is today if a lot of different people are not coming together to contribute their time to it. Although there are people that are paid to contribute to Linux, some of the maintainers, right? But there are like multiple people coming together, fixing things as simple as maybe typos or minor bug fixes. And those people make the lives of billions of people better every day. And I said billions because I believe Linux currently runs on billions of devices. Because Android is an open source operating system. But under the hood, Android uses like the Linux kernel. There's like Linux operating systems. Your car stereos run on Linux. Your smartwatches run on Linux under the hood. So one way or the other, by just making a simple contribution, something as little as fixing a minor bug, you can improve the experience of millions of other people and improve your own experience. So there are, there are people who have been doing this, who have enabled you to be able to use some softwares for free. So it just it just feels like, um, I like to see open source as a community because that's what it is. So I like to see contributing to open source as you giving back to the community. And I feel like it's something everyone that is a developer, or not just a developer, because open source is not just about contributing code. Um, you can contribute to open source as a writer, and you can also contribute to open source as a designer. So I, I, I just see it as a way in which people will work in technology as an opportunity for them to help improve the technology that they've been using for free. Um, so I'm going to share my own personal experience with open source, right? Um, I started out not understanding or not knowing what open source is. Having no clue, no idea. But it just started from me wanting to collaborate with someone on a software, and I couldn't find like an easy way to do it. Then I discovered Git. Um, so Git is like a version control software. I'm not going to go in depth into what it is. But basically, people who contribute in open source need to like manage different versions of their software. They need to constantly make updates to it, and they need a way to like collaborate using something called a repository, which is like the own for like the software itself. Um, so when I discovered Git, I discovered I could collaborate with other people in a seamless way. And then I discovered GitHub. And then I discovered that GitHub had this thing called public repositories. And it was so fascinating that there was just so much code online available to me for free to either contribute to improve or just under the hood learn how they worked. And that was something that was um, very interesting to me. Then eventually I got to learn about some certain open source programs. Um, some of you might have heard of these programs before. Um, one is called the Google Summer of Code, and there's another one called Google Season of Docs. So Google Summer of Code is just like an internship where Google is sponsoring certain companies. Um, they submit multiple projects, and then you as someone who has already contributed to open source or is looking forward to contributing to open source can go over this multiple project and see which of them have um, used the technologies that you work with, then you can apply to this project. 
when you apply to those projects, the mentors review your application and they select um, a specific list of interns. Um, some organizations can select as little so as one, some can select as high as 10 interns to work on different projects. And you get like mentorship for I think three months. Um, so when you get mentorship for three months, the mentor is going to be there to guide you through the contribution phase. It's just really a very good way to get into open source. And the other interesting part is that you get paid to contribute to open source. Um, so I think, I, I don't know how much GSOC pays currently, but I think as of that time, I think it was about um, $3,000 for those three months. I can't remember. But then I discovered like those programs, but like my first open source contribution was not via GSOC. My first open source contribution was, was via something called Oktoberfest. It's organized by Digital Ocean. It happens every October. Um, they tell you to sign up and make, I think, at least five open source contributions. And then it took my out how small the open source contributions were. I remember that my first contribution was me fixing a typo in a readme. I can't remember what project it was that I contributed to, but I just fixed a typo in a readme. Um, the one other contribution I made was in the code, there was a particular comment that I felt was not very clear. And I just rewarded the comment and made it like more clear for people to understand. And then I made a pull request. It got approved. It got matched. And I got this very cool shirt and stickers from Digital Ocean that had October 1st. I think, I can't remember the year. I think it was 2018, thereabouts. I can't remember. But yeah, it, it was very rewarding to actually contribute to a software used by many people, even though it was something as little as correcting a type or fixing a comment and then getting like a cool swag for it. I was very excited about that experience. And it just sort of went from there to me applying for like Google Summer of Code. Um, for Google Summer of Code, it was a whole ball game of experience because um, there's the application phase where you have to make contributions for the selection process. And um, I was able to submit an application. Eventually I didn't get selected for Google Summer of Code, um, but, I then moved on the next year to apply for Google Season of Docs because technical writing was um, something I had been doing for a while. I wasn't super experienced with it, but when I discovered that code isn't just isn't just the only way to contribute to open source, that I could also contribute to open source. Um, sorry, Abby, please. How many minutes do I have? So I um, do not go past my time. Um, eighteen. Um, later out. Twelve minutes more, and um, then five minutes for questions. So, how many minutes do I have left for questions? Um, thirteen minutes more. Okay, thirteen minutes. All right, no worries. Um, um. So, for those who are interested in any of these programs, you feel free to just reach out to me. Um, after the session, we could talk extensively about them. But I'm just going to walk through the experience, through my own experience. Perhaps you could learn a thing or two from it if you are looking at, if you are um, working towards participating in any of these open source programs. Um, so there's like the application phase where you interact with the mentors, you get to understand the project. It's highly recommended that you start making contributions to those projects. And for some projects, they create issues for prospective interns. Some of them are like labeled good first issues. Those ones are like entry level issues that you could tackle that you could tackle on like the GitHub repository and work on. So yeah, I was mentioning my experience with technical writing and then discovering Google Season of Docs. Um, so initially when I applied to GSOC, I applied to Wikimedia Foundation. Um, Wikimedia Foundation is the company that hosts Wikipedia, um, the free encyclopedia. And they have like a lot of other wikis too that um, um, that the that Wikimedia Foundation has. But eventually I didn't make GSOC. Um, I got a rejection. Then I went on to apply for Google Season of Docs and um, I got in. And primarily because I was very familiar with the organization already. Um, during the GSOC phase, I had already consumed a lot of their wikis, a lot of like the automations and whatnot that they have in place. So it was, I, I wouldn't say easy, but it, it, it was just me continued, me continued to contribute to something I was already contributing to. Um, 
so a huge part of all this process is one you have to be very communicative and keep an open mind and be ready to learn because really contributing to open source is all about learning either you're a senior engineer contributing to a project or you're a junior or mid-level engineer that just wants to make your first contribution contributing to open source is always about learning you can never know it all so if you are newly contributing to a new project you would always learn one thing or the other regardless of how good you are even people that build some open source projects learn new things about the projects they build and they develop because other people are other people have contributed to it and it has grown beyond the scope of what they initially had so um I submitted an application and I got in. So for GSOD, it's slightly different from GSOD, right? Um, I think GSOD, you have the option to either do three months or extend it to six months. Um, while I was at Media Foundation, it was just like a three months program. I had mentors and I was contributing to like documentations, um, documentations for something called, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember uh, the name of it so. I can't remember the name of the tool, but it was basically a tool for creating wikis. And that tool was one of the tools they used to create Wikipedia. Now imagine the search volume Wikipedia has every day. And as a student, getting the opportunity to contribute to a tool that was used to develop Wikipedia, it's a very fulfilling experience, really, because you're contributing to something of value. And then you know that the contributions that you're making so some of these projects actually get used by millions or thousands of people, at least, depending on the project you're contributing to. Um, so I did a lot of interesting work with Wikimedia Foundation. And one interesting part was I got paid for it. I think for GSOD, it was about $6,000. Now imagine as a student um, who does not have a job and is still depending on allowances from your parents, getting the chance to earn that much money. Like, it would... <laughs> the kind of motivation it will give you is going to be on a whole different level, right? And I'm not saying you should want to participate in these programs because of the money, right? You should do it absolutely because of the experience and absolutely because you want to learn. Um, because eventually you'd finish spending the money, but it is never going to leave your... It's probably never going to leave your CV that you participated in that program, right? It's always going to be there as one of your experiences. The knowledge you've gained from contributing to some of these projects is always going to be with you, and it help you in future job of, um, roles that you apply for. And after my like internship with Wikimedia Foundation, I applied to GSOG again to um, a company called Chaos Native. Um, they maintain a project called Litmus Chaos that they use for chaos testing, um, with Kubernetes and SRF stuff. Now, I'm always particular about talking about this particular, um, this particular one because while I was applying, I felt I wasn't good enough. And why I felt I wasn't good enough was because the project I was applying for seemed very interesting. It had a lot to do with site reliability, engineering, um, DevOps, and cloud computing and whatnot. And if you know little about the cloud, you know that... Um, you have to understand tools like Docker, Kubernetes, and whatnot. I did not even know what Docker was. I didn't even know what Kubernetes was. And I was applying to a project that does chaos engineering. Literally, you have to like eat and breathe Kubernetes to even contribute to such a project. And during the application process, I was very clear up front. I was like, hey, I'm a JavaScript engineer. I've contributed to this particular project I've written for this particular company before. I worked as a technical writer. This is my experience level, but I have no idea of, I, I don't know what Kubernetes is. I have never worked with Docker, but I am willing to learn if you're giving me the opportunity to intern with you. I'm a great writer, I'm a fast learner, but I just do not understand the technology you work with. And to my greater surprise, I got in, because during the um, application process, you see other interns that are also submitting applications and stuff. There were a lot more people that were more experienced than I was. They're already working with Kubernetes and some of these technologies. And I was surprised that me, who had never, who didn't even know what Kubernetes was, because just, just something I had was, was the person they selected. 
So oftentimes when you want to apply, it's okay to feel like you are not skilled enough. But if you feel that way, it's also okay to communicate it to the mentor up front or include it in your application process. That while you feel you do not have the necessary skills, you are open to learning and it's something you are very, very interested in. And then focus on talking about like your strengths, what your strengths are and whatnot. Um, so that was it for me. And eventually, they gave me, I think, a month or two months. Um, so I had to like do the internship for six months. And they gave me like in the first of first month or first two months to catch up with Docker and Kubernetes and then go ahead to learn their own tool that they use for chaos engineering, which is most chaos. So for like, the first two months, I wasn't contributing anything. I was just busy learning about the technologies I needed to contribute. And for the next four months, I was actually contributing documentation and whatnot. And eventually you got, and eventually I got paid for it as well. So like, these are like, some of like different programs that you can participate in, right? The organizations that also pay you to contribute to open source. I know of Open Collective. Um, open Collective is um, they have like open source repositories, but they're front end and back end, and they create like issues in their repositories and tag those issues. Um, some of them are easy, medium, ads, uh, depending on some of those issues. They have like um, different awards, monetary awards that they give to people. Um, so really, uh, what, what I want to mention is how it has shaped my career, right? Um, I currently work in developer relations. And if you work in developer relations, you know it's a mix of different things, right? It's a mix of community advocacy. Um, you get to attend events and speak. You get to do a lot of writing and also a lot of content. You get to interact with the community. Basically, you are the ultimate bridge between the developer ecosystem and your company if you work in developer relations. And while I'm a developer relations engineer, I could tell you that for the past like one or two months, a lot of what I've been doing has been me contributing to content, right? I've had like a couple of events that I spoke at. Um, I have like a lot of other things that I do, but has been me writing, right? And contributing to projects like the one I contributed to at Linux Foundation, um, I said at Linux Foundation, at Wikimedia Foundation and um, Chaos Native just helped me improve. In fact, at some point I had um, a technical writing CV and the two most prominent experiences that I had on my technical writing CV was my GSOT participation at Wikimedia Foundation and my GSOT participation at Chaos Native. Those were like the two highlights of my technical writing CV. I, although I had like one other technical role that I did for I think three, I think three to five months, I can't remember, which is also on my CV and maybe some other articles that I wrote for like distribution and some other properties. But the major ones that were like on my CV were like my GSOT participation. Now there are other people too who are students who have like a CV as well. And the major highlight on their CV are like their GSOC participation, if you get to participate in GSOC. So I know like when you like graduate and you're applying for roles and you want to get employed, oftentimes they would expect a junior engineer with one to two years of experience or a mid-level engineer with three to five years experience or whatever, right? Contributing to some of these open source, contributing to open source is a way of getting that experience. And it does not have to be you going through GSOC or GSOC, GSOC. It could be just you finding a tool that you use and discovering that that tool is open source, um, going on GitHub, if it's open source, it definitely has a community behind it, um, joining their community conversations, trying to look for issues um, that are good to start with, and just making contributions to it. You find out that if you've made at least three to five very worthy contributions to a project, I think it is worth mentioning on your CV, even if you've never really had a role as a developer or if you've never worked officially at a company before. It goes a long way, including it on your CV. Now imagine me having like a CV and the two major things on my CV were like open source contributions that I made, right? So it, it goes a long way in you getting actual work experience. You're not working for a company, but you're contributing to something meaningful. Um, so I think now just take questions. So I do not take too much of here, right, thank but you. Yeah, if you have, yeah. Thank you very much, um, Daddy Bo. Um, so if you have any questions, please um just signify using the um 
virtual and um, um, symbol or icon. So we can take your question and then move to the next speaker as well. Any questions? I mean, I believe people should have questions. There are almost 60 people on this call. If no one has questions, is either have explained this so perfectly well, which is very, very unlikely, or I've done a very terrible job at communicating <laughs> at communicating anything about everything I've said. So please, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Okay, second, you can yeah, go please. on. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, good evening, everyone. So, uh, my question basically is, um, how does um, the allocation of what you want to contribute to, how is it done open source on open source, basically? Is it like to tell you you do this, this is what you contribute to, or you just, yeah, if you, is it like you pick what you contribute to, and when you are picking something you are contributing to, how will you be sure that somebody else has not picked that problem too? So, how does your um, solution role and everything, how does it work? Okay, so um, a, a lot of open source contributions that happen happen on something called a repository. Um, I know you must have heard of something like GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket. They are like um, different platforms where you can create like open source repositories. So there are like multiple ways in which you can discover contributions that you want to make. And now I mentioned that a lot of different tools and libraries that you make use of are open source. And um, because you are the one, you are the primary user, one way in which you could discover things to contribute to these open source projects are perhaps when you're using it and something is missing. Like, let me give you a very good example. There was a time I was working with, I think, Flutterwave uh, APIs, and they have like an SDK. And I figured that there was something their API supported that was missing in their SDK. And I went online, just it was open source. I read the code and understood it. And I made a pull request. So I contributed to, you know, eventually it didn't get matched, right? But I'm just like trying to use that as an example of a time when I was using something and I felt the need to prove it. So I felt something in the SDK I was using. And I understood the added that feature that was missing and made a pull request. So a pull request is just you saying, this is your code. I have changed something there. I have improved it. These are the things I changed. Please review it and add it to the major project itself. So that's essentially what a pull request is. And I made a pull request. So that's one way of discovering things to contribute to. Another way of discovering things to contribute to is through something called issues on GitHub. Now, people who are maintainers of open source projects understand that people will constantly have issues with their projects. And things will definitely be broken at some point, or people will have a need to want to request for improvements. So issues are where all of this happens, right? For issues, it could be you experiencing a problem and you create an issue on GitHub. Or it could be you feeling something is not working the way it should, or it could be you feeling like this thing needs to be improved and it's not at its optimal performance yet, and just creating an issue. Now, note that an issue is not you contributing to the project directly. An issue is just you highlighting a problem or something that can be improved in the project. Now, people who want to contribute to this project will then go over the list of issues that have been created and find the ones that they think they are able to contribute to and write some code and create a pull request that fixes that issue. Um, so now there's often like a convention of, if you are working on a specific issue, you know, there's always like a communication barrier that you mentioned that how do you know someone else is not working on it? It's always a good idea to put a comment on another issue that, hey, I would like to take up this issue and fix it, right? And if you left that comment, any other person that comes, you know that someone is already working on this. But it's always a good idea to tag one of the maintainers as a comment on another issue that, hey, I would like to uh, work on this issue. Is any other person working on it? Or is it assigned to someone else? Or is it assigned to someone else? Um, so like, those are like different ways in which you could go about it. Um, Shagun, can you 
piece of meat itself and ask your question. Um, yeah, Shagun is done with the question. The other question, um, by Asan, um, Akinola says, um, thanks, thank you for this talk. Um, I've been in web development for almost a year, but not knowing the structure of how I should learn as for contributing to open source or build something that tests the knowledge. And how can you also advise a beginner that starts with the web dev and finishes his front end stack successfully? Okay, been in web dev for almost a year. I should learn as well. Okay, so in terms of um, okay, so in terms of contributing to open source, it's right. Um, I believe, like, as a software engineer just getting started, um, before you start considering you contributing to open source, the first thing you should learn are the tools that would enable you to contribute to open source, um, which is you understanding the version control system and learn something called Git. Um, so version control systems is just a way of um, basically you versioning your, so imagine, I'm, I'm thinking of the best way to explain this. So imagine you have like um, a chess board, and then at every point in time, chess takes a long, longer hours to like play. So imagine you take like 30 minutes break while you're playing a long chess game, and every time you take a break, you're taking a screenshot, or you're taking a picture of everything on the board. So that when you come back, if maybe, you have a toddler that just scatters everything on the chest, but you're able to look at the picture and put the cone where the cone is supposed to be, put the king where the king is supposed to be, and continue playing your game. Then if you need to go back to, and let's say for every time you take a picture, you give it a version name, version one, version two, version three, version four. And maybe at some point, you guys just put up the game and you're like, okay, let's start from version three. I just look at the screenshots and go back to that specific version and I rearrange the chess but that's essentially what version control is basically basically just snapshots and just snapshots in different versions of your code and you've been able to manage it. But it also helps with multiple people contributing or working on the same project, right? So I believe the first thing you should learn is to understand the version control system and understand how to use a tool called Git, which would enable you to contribute to open source, right? And the next thing would be work on Project, right? One way to develop your skills is by building. So you can work on side projects. Now, some of these side projects, right? It, it might not be you contributing to an open source, already existing open source project, but you can just look for someone who is just starting off. You guys can work on, it does not matter what app it is. It could be a to do app, it could be a schedule planner, it could be something a million people have built before. But basically, work on something with someone, and you guys should make it an open source repository. Right, create a repository on GitHub. You guys should collaborate on that repository together. Not, I don't mean writing code on the same laptop. Like you have like your own laptop. You are making um, Git commit. You are pushing it to the repository, and you are making pull requests. And when you are making like a pull request, you have the person review your code. When the person is making a pull request, you review the person's code. That way, you are contributing to an open source project, right? Now, it, it does not matter if no one is using the project, but you're developing the skills you need to actually contribute to open source projects by doing that, collaborating. Basically, open source is all about collaboration. So you're contributing to someone in an open, you're collaborating on a project with someone in an open source manner. It's just prepping you for that. Then when you feel you're confident enough in your skills to actually contribute to some open source projects, right? You can then be on the lookout for like different front end projects that you can contribute to. One very um, a good hack is your favorite tools. Look for their documentation. Do you use Vue.js? Look for the Vue.js documentation. It's a front end app and it's often not as complex as contributing to a library. Contribute to the documentation projects of Vue.js, of Nox.js, of React.js, of Express.js. A lot of those documentations are open source on GitHub. They are often not as complex as contributing to, um, let's say, contributing to ExpressJS framework now. It's going to be a lot easier to contribute to ExpressJS documentation than it is to contribute to ExpressJS framework. Or let's say React. It's a lot easier to contribute to the React documentation than it is to contribute to the ReactJS framework. So a pro tip is just look for documentation of some of your favorite projects. Try to go through their project structure. Go through their issues 
and look through the issues, look for issues with the label, good first issue, and try to tackle those good first issues. Then reach out to one of the some of the mentors. If they reply, fine. If they don't, no problem. Make sure you make a pull request. Follow their community guideline. Do their contribution guides. Make your first pull request. If you make a pull request, definitely someone will comment on your pull request and review your code. Then just keep doing that, and you figure that you keep improving and getting better at it. Um, thank you very much. Um, valuable. Um, I think I've been able to like take some um things from your session. Um, incremental progress. Um, from whatever we are doing, and um, yeah, I believe everyone on the call that also um picked one or two things. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll be moving to the next um speaker session. Um, she's a UX researcher, um, a product designer, and an open source design maintainer. So for designers among us, um, she's also um, a technical steering committee at Async API Spec and an alumnus at Outreachy. Um, she's no other one that um, Aisha moved in. Yeah, Aisha, can you go on, please? I'm sorry, you're muted, um, Haisha. Hello? Am I audible? Um, yes, you are. Yeah. Thank right, you very thank much. You. I'm going to share my slides now. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, Aisha. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about. Yeah, okay. Can you see my screen as well? Um, yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. I'll be talking about contributing to open source as a product designer. My name is Aisha Tsvegudin. About me, I'm a user experience researcher and a product designer with over two years of experience, a technical steering committee, and a design and website maintainer at Async API initiative. Nice to meet everyone. Okay, so these are the key takeaways from my presentation. Familiarizing yourself with open source, contributing to open source as a product designer. What are the advantages for we product designers? Tackling the obstacles. I'll also talk about my experience and we are going to entertain questions. First of all, what is open source? Open source refers to software shared with its source code, allowing users to access it, modify, and distribute. It also allows everyone to like contribute to the source code, make changes, and suggest new features. You can also use the code for your purpose, like for your own purpose, or contribute to the entire contribute to improving the entire project's features. Examples of open source. Like, we actually use some of the software that open source, we just don't know. And thanks to the first speaker, I think he did a good justice to explaining all those things. So, VLC Media Player, for example, is an open source software. Even me, I didn't know about that. But uh, some few uh, time later, uh, also, we have Async API Initiative, we have Mozilla Firefox, Enox. Opia Foundation, Blender for Designers, many more. Now that we have grabbed the concept of open source, let's dive into the practical steps of becoming a design contributor in an open source project. How can I contribute? The first thing I would like advise you to do is to check if your frequently used applications are open source. 
you can check that on GitHub or on the website. You can also search and install projects on GitHub. And by doing this, you can open an account, explore the GitHub repository. I always explain repository as a as a branch. Don't take the meaning of a branch as a branch because the branch also has another mini, a, a technical mini in GitHub. So I just, I believe the tree is the project you want to contribute to. And in that tree, you have different branches. So the branches are the repository. You have to explore the repository. Browse issues, like look for design issues, easy research issues, and read the issue description. Also, you have to review comments, like, for example, if there is a if you want to contribute to, some people might have made comments on that it of like a space of stuff. So you have to like read those things and ask questions. Another thing is to understand the contribution guidelines. And after you have done that, you are ready to work on the design. Okay. Once you are done with the design, you have to collaborate and iterate with other people. Then celebrate your contribution. I'll go back to the previous slide. Okay, another thing is to browse. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Understand the project needs. Yes. So before contributing to a project, you need to understand what the project is all about. Don't just jump to contributing to the project. Then join the community, introduce yourself, make yourself known. Start small. I'll be talking about uh, my experience contributing as a product designer during the October 1st program. Then collaborate and engage with other people. So, advantages for product designers or UXUI designer. We have some paid open source program. Open source is also called OSS. We have Outreach. I'm also an Outreach alumni. We have Async API, we have Google Season of Docs, Google Season of Code, LFX. Outreach is a three month internship program where you get to be paid some thousand USD dollars for contributing to open source. We also have other paid in, uh, internship programs. So we have Google Season of Docs is paid, some of Google to is paid as well. In short, LFX is also paid. I think you'll be paid $300 or so. I'm not sure. What are the benefits of all these contributions? First of all, you have a chance to collaborate with experts all around the world in a supportive environment. You get to like explain your ideas, collaborate with people, with different sorts of people to work on a project that is available and free to all. You also have the ability to work on projects that are used by actual users, not just dummy projects where you like have access to get feedback and all. Also, contributing to OSS will help you build your portfolio, allowing you to make an impact on something that is used by numerous people. Another thing is it opens just for job opportunities, freelance work or consulting gigs, global recognition and passage through future uh, future opportunities. Okay. I understand that as a designer, I also face some obstacles when I want to start contributing to a process. I want to think about technical barrier. I didn't know how to navigate my way through the top. I was like, this thing is so scary. I don't know how to do it. But one of the things I did there was like understanding where I want to contribute to. As a designer, looking at a user interface, I know if a button is not, uh, is not well placed, it is wrong this felt or is there something wrong in the interface so understanding all those things make me realize that okay this is what i want to do this is how i want to do it also navigating it up i'm going to be explaining how i did that in, during my uh, experience session okay understanding the project goals i think i've explained that and the user needs users needs yeah you need to understand who the users of the projects are you need to understand them to be able to design or contribute to the project as well. Design insecurity. Yeah, I understand that for me. Um, I know how it feels when you work, like when you're working on a design and you don't want people to see the rough sketch, you know, 
But trust me, I've been there and you should be you shouldn't be scared of that. You should be open to collaborating with people and showing them what you have done so you'll be able to receive feedback from them. My experience, yeah. So um open source. Uh, I never knew about open source so for a very long time. But last year, I said my first contribution in open source. My sister has been talking about open source, open source, open source. I'm like, this thing is not paid, so why would I contribute to open source? But then I came across Async API on Twitter. They were uh, receiving applicants for the for technical rights, and I was like, well, I can contribute to this. But initially, I was not interested in contributing contributing to technical rights because I was more interested in design. Anyways, I applied to it. And when I was talking to the iron manager, I told her I was more interested in design and I would love to contribute to design. So she referred me to the design lead then. And I signed my contribution last year, October, by designing speaker cards for the Async API conference, online conference. I designed my speaker cards and got accepted and merged. And I was so happy seeing it online, like everybody retweeting, posting about it, and all of that. After that experience, um, I heard about our teaching, our teaching internship, and I also applied to that as well. I applied and under Opia Foundation, I was accepted as an intern. I work as a user researcher, understanding what the project was. Opia Foundation. I was able to contribute to Open Foundation for, I think, four months or so. And after contributing, I was paid seven thousand US dollars. Was that? I knew I don't know my way around GitHub, so what I did was to enter people's DM. Like I know active people. In the community, I'll just enter the agenda. I'll be like, oh. and I, I was able to do that. Yeah, I was able to do that with that. Uh, I was able to look for videos and now I can like start contributing actually for issues myself. And yeah, I designed the website for the Async API conference. Online, oh, so it's not online conference, it's a, it's a global conference that is going to take place in four different locations across the globe. Thank you. Given enough highballs, all bugs are shallow. Yeah. So, one thing is that open source is all about collaboration. You shouldn't be scared to get involved in open source. Trust me, the moment you like, you understand that you want to start contributing and you are open to learning. There are people that is going to help you learn and help you get started. So you should not be okay. I'm sorry, I was checking out the point. You should not be scared to contribute. We designers, let's be an agent of change, an agent of improving user experience in the community like you have chosen to contribute to. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Aisha. I really appreciate um, your um, talk about open session and um, gain some new insights about that. Um, I'm aware that um, many designers, in fact, majority of designers, have um, a tough time navigating their way around um, open source. And I believe with your session, they would have gained even um, newer insights regarding that. And then they'll be able to like um take um actionable steps regarding that, and um yeah.
So please, do you have any question? Um, kindly uh, make use of the virtual hand so we can take your question. I'm um, over. You can go, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um. Hi, Aisha. Thank you so much for your session. Um. Just as a quick intro. Um. I'm the GDNC UIUX lead for this session, and I was really anticipating your session because. Even before now, I've not really been into open source myself, and it was something I was really looking forward to. So I think for the most part, you already answered most of the questions. And this was exactly what I wanted to ask about, about some resources that you could drop that we could hopefully share with the community. Um, and I think you've done that already. So um, thank you so much. Um, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure. So there's something else I wanted to mention. I can't quite remember now. So if in any case I would I would probably just be in touch. But thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Abib. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Over. Thank you. Um anyone else has a question, please. Okay, you can go on, please. So yeah, see you are. Um um, thank you so much, Aisha. Thank you for your session. Please, can you confirm if you can hear me? Um, yes, I can, Aniola. Yeah, I can. Great. Okay, great. So, um, I just wanted you to speak a little more to how you conquered imposter syndrome because there is a tendency to want to cook, in quotes, you know, before you start applying for things like this. But at what point would you recommend for people to start shooting their shots in applying? To contribute so thanks so much thank you sorry i didn't get your question oh okay um can you hear me clearly yes i can okay great i said that my question is um the first and of it right is how to conquer imposter syndrome you know in um the instance where a person is contributing for the first time to open source then at what point would you recommend for someone to start shooting shots you know there is the tendency to want to cook finish there is the tendency to want to be perfect it has the word you get and meanwhile you're stalling you're really taking time where you can already be contributing. So at what point would you recommend for people to take that leap to apply? Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so I'm going to answer that question by sharing my experience. You know, I mentioned that my sister has, uh, like, has been encouraged, has been encouraging me to contribute to open source. But during that time, I was mainly focused on learning. I was like, no, I can't do this. Unless I've learned this, I don't think I'll be able to do this unless I know this. But I got to a point I was like, no, I just have to stop this, like, stop this and actually do the learning, start learning, like, do the work you rather not learning now. And we all face imposter syndrome in one way or the other, trust me. Just have to believe in yourself that you can do it. And as the first speaker mentioned, sorry. I didn't get your name, I don't know how to pronounce it. He mentioned something that I really, really do grab. He said when he wanted to apply, it, he, he, he mentioned it during his application that he didn't have experience in this thing, and the mentors are like they were able to help him. So I think that's a very good thing to do. If you feel you don't have the, you don't have enough skills and you like, you feel that imposter syndrome, so you can do that as well. But at the same time. Trust me, even me, I still feel imposter syndrome at times. Just, just have to believe in yourself that you can do it. Just have that belief and be open to communicating with other people as well. Does that answer your question? Um. Yes, it did. Just with a further question, right? Okay. That's fine. 
Yeah, it is. Okay, so the, 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 the follow-up question is going to be, um, you know, balancing being good at your craft and then seeking to gain this experience because, of course, we want to take that leap, you know, to make contributions to open source, but at the same time, there is the other place of knowing what you want to contribute. So, is there any logic to that or anything you can say to that, please? You mean how to contribute? I didn't get that question. So. Okay, I mean, um, balancing, you know, the desire to want to contribute to open source and also taking the time to learn. Like you said, at some point you were focused on learning and then there was a point you think you were ready to take the what was, you know, what was needed at every point, like learning first and then, you know, contributing at some other points. I wanted you to speak a little more to that. Okay, so during that, I think it's pretty straightforward. So the thing is, you just have to keep playing. Trust me. Just like you might put a lot more effort during it, but you just have to keep playing and not to balance everything. For example, I'm working on an issue now. It's on um, conducting usability testing on the async API, on the async API tools. Trust me, I know how to do that. I've done that before. But the fact is that, but the thing is, that I can't even remember, and I feel I can't do this. So, as like, start reading, start watching videos, articles, mm -hmm. and all of that, just mm -hmm. to like do the issue, just to work on the issue. So, you know, I'm trying to like balance me learning and me working on that issue. So, you just have to understand what you want to do and don't stop learning. You can't stop learning. Trust me. Can you hear me? Um, yes, Aisha. Um, yeah, thank you very much for that. Hello? Um, yeah. Um, it was an insightful session. And I believe um, every designer on the call would have picked um, important points today. And by now, they should be eager to get started also on their open source journey. Um, yeah, we'll be moving to our last speaker. Um, that is in person of um, Damilola Alimi. Um, she's an open source support engineer um, using Flutter at Code Magic. Um, she's a mobile engineer and the tech community leader with a passion for building and creating innovative solutions that drive positive change. Um, with over two, two years of experience in software development, she has earned her skills in designing and developing mobile applications using Flutter framework. And throughout her career, and she has demonstrated a strong commitment to excellence and a willingness to embrace new challenges. Um, so join me in welcoming Dami Lola Alimi. Yes, Dami, you can go on, please. Um, hello, everyone. Please, can you confirm you can hear me? Um, hi, Dami. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for having me, everyone. So um, I would like to like, give a quick uh, disclaimer. I'm unable to put on my video because I I'm currently going through like some kind of pain, and yeah, I'm basically just recovering from a quick surgery. So, but another thing is, this would be like a very unscripted talk. I've already helped me with the guideline, so I will just be speaking based on my experience, and I hope we can all get one or two things from what i have to say today yeah thank you very much so yeah like abib said my name is damala alimi and i'm a student of the university of bado and i also currently work as an open source support engineer at code magic so basically most of my work is to help people do open source so um you can refer to us as the open source maintainers maintainers of the Flutter repository how many Flutter developers do we have here? If a Flutter developer, you can just give a thumbs up. We are a very huge fan of Flutter devs. So if you're a Flutter developer, please just, you know, okay, I see our uh, Flutter lead. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, yeah, um, I'm an open, like I said earlier, I'm an open source maintainer, and I just really want to talk about, like, my personal experience with open source. So when I got started with Flutter in 2020, yeah, I think, yeah, 2020, most of the open source, like I remember I did then was, I joined a lot of communities, because 
getting into tech, I'm a huge fan of communities because I believe that one of the things that can help you like grow really quick is by being active in a community. By being active, I'm not someone to be very outspoken, maybe like on a community group chat to be very outspoken. But once probably somebody on the, you know, these tech agbars, when they drop like their code bases or links to their GitHub projects they are working on, some of them would majorly talk about, okay, who can, who wants to contribute to this, who wants to do this, who wants to do that. So I'll just basically like open it up or send them like a message privately like, oh, okay, like I really like what you are doing and I would like to contribute. So I'll say that was like my mini experience with open source and that was actually just in 2020 by the time i got full blown into mobile development i was majorly just building apps on my own working within t- within my team basically so we have code we write codes our team lead reviews it every other member of the team basically reviews the code which i would also refer to as kind of like open source collaboration right so yeah i'll say that was actually my very first experience with open source until not until early this year when there was an opportunity i think i got the i saw the opportunity on twitter to actually perform primary triage on the flutter repository and it's actually really really wild because looking at the job description it actually really looks like something that oh you need to have like a lot of experience to be able to obviously verify issues that people are filing in the Flutter repository, but yeah, I gave it a shot, and I remember there were like a lot of interview processes, and well, to the glory of God, we got it right. So, um, another thing I would say, right, is that this opportunity, this opportunity, I got to be exposed to this opportunity through the communities I've been in, through people that I've met, right. If you remember at the beginning, at the early stage, I said when I started writing Flutter, I would join a lot of communities, I would volunteer in communities. When people drop open source projects, I would like send them a message and tell them that, oh yeah, uh, I really like what you're doing, I would like to contribute, I would like to write two lines of code to be able to like, probably do this or do that. So obviously those people formed my network that probably retweeted this into my time, into my tier, right? So, and it has really changed my career because working on various issues, in, on the Flutter repository has obviously exposed me to a lot of things I didn't know about Flutter as a whole, right? So now, I think let me just divert from how this has helped me and how anyone can get started. So I remember when the first speaker was talking, he said, okay, you could file issues in the repositories. So basically every, um, should I say every uh, project that is open source has the opportunity for you to file issues. So... I don't want to streamline my talk to just Flutter, but let, let me just try to like talk from the Flutter point of view. So, for instance, if you are working, maybe probably Flutter is a framework, right? You are building a mobile application, and probably maybe when you were working, when you were testing your mobile application on an iPhone 13 Pro Max, you realize that ah, this scrolling is not really scrolling as fast as it was scrolling on it on an iPhone 11. Yeah, sure, you are welcome. You can find issues on the Flutter repository. And I want to believe that actually finding issues is some sort of contribution. Because that way, you've been able to call the attention of the team to the fact that scrolling is not working perfectly fine on the Flutter repository. So, another way you can also probably contribute is, so this, somebody has found an issue and the person has said, oh, on an iPhone 13 Pro Max, I'm unable to, I'm unable to scroll very well. If you have an iPhone 13, Pro Max. You can just test with the code sample that the person has used. You can just test and drop a comment and say, oh, okay, I also probably verified on an iPhone 14 Pro or, or this, and I realized that this scrolling is also not working there, right? You are giving more information to the Flutter team, and you are making, and then it is the process of fixing that particular issue a little bit faster, right? So, me, that's just, to me, that's just, like, an easy way to, like, get started. Or, should I say, for someone that probably doesn't even have any experience working with GitHub, and I feel there's a linear progression from there. If you find issues, if you comment on issues, but one of the things that I would really advise you not do is probably when you see an issue, I say, oh, me too. I've seen it. You know, provide more information on it. Okay, so somebody has said on testing Pro Max, I cannot scroll very well. Don't just come and say, oh, me too. I cannot scroll very well, right? Because take it further that, oh, okay, probably when the person was running on 13 Pro Max, the person was working with impeller rendering. When I tried without impeller, I realized that this is was it happening. So like that's another way to let the Flutter team know that okay, this issue could actually just be peculiar to Impella and it makes the process of fixing that particular issue 
easier, <clears throat> right? So moving away from um issues, so um let's now talk about contributing to flutter on its own, right? There's one popular belief, and I feel like I think the second part, somebody will ask a question concerning imposter syndrome and the likes, which is actually very real. So everybody might feel, oh, I just started Flutter last year. What do I know that? I've never even started video mobile apps. Is it me that will not contribute to the Flutter repository on your own, right? So you really do not have to be a pro before you can contribute to these repositories because there are some issues as little as... I remember I came across an issue and what the only thing was, I think maybe when the person was... The person ran a particular command, and the feedback that the person got from the prompt was something like run flutter pop clear, right? Oh, but if you run flutter pop clear, you get a wrong, um, what's it called? You get a wrong output, right? Or probably wasn't even a command on its own. And the right thing was to run flutter pop kick, right? That particular thing was just, it's, it's a minor issue, right? Because it's just to look for where that particular thing was being returned and change kick to clear or change clear to kick rather that one is like a very very simple issue but if you do not probably familiarize yourself with the old flutter github this thing you might really not even see the issue so when you see something like that and you see somebody found the issue you see that you can just probably type in the comments that oh i would like to work on this or you can just open uh, what's called you can just fix it and open a pr right and tag those that are going to work review it and they're always very prompt with reviewing so contributing to the repository can be as little as just changing a single line just changing probably um when the person was writing maybe button you saw it in documentation instead of button the person wrote b u triple t o n instead of b u t t o n right so it's like that easy to actually contribute to this open source um what's it called this open source projects even when they might seem like very very big so and i think that's going to be one of my like advice to newbies just getting started get familiar with these open source repositories look through the issues read through the issues people file you might want to also test these issues and see whether you are experiencing this you, can, you might want to give your own view on the issue now um another thing is i would always tell uh, people just starting out join communities you really cannot underestimate the impact of communities so join communities communities are going to help you a lot in getting started then um if i could go back in time sorry i'm just reading like the outline that i have if i could go back in time what would i have done differently so i think um basically if i could go back in time i would have contributed to more open source projects i really didn't, i didn't know about i think until i probably started interacting well with um maya that's its second speaker i didn't really know much that they were even like programs open source programs that are actually paid i didn't even know much about october 1st until i became a gdsc school i didn't know that all of these things existed so if i could go back in time i think i would have done more of open source because open you really to me right all this kind of like open source projects at the point when i was contributing to open source i really had no any work i was doing i didn't have commitment while they side school so i could easily just open this project If a JavaScript developer, if a Flutter developer, and if you if you really want to look at I don't really know if there's like an idea bank where people drop their projects and say, okay, well, I'm making my project open source and I would like people to contribute. But like I said earlier, in joining communities, people really come on com come online communities to talk about projects they are working on and that they would like other people to also contribute to. So I think, um, what's it called? I think joining communities would actually give you access to this pool of open source projects that you can work on. Um, so um, basically, I think um, that's most likely all I would like to talk about. I really hope that 
um you're able to pick one or two things from what i've been able to see and probably maybe later on if you are interested in flutter i can actually go deep dive into finding issues contributing to flutter repository as a whole but yeah um i would take questions now and thank you very much everyone for having me um thank you very much dami um your um session was quite insightful um, I think a uh, majority of um, developers, especially um, those more in Flutter, would probably have gained one or two things from this. Um, so if you have any questions, please kindly signify so we can um, go on. Anyone? Um, Allow me to please go with your question. Um, you're on mute, so please can you um um, sorry, I'm mute. Can you unmute and okay, yeah. So this is yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I can go on please. I can't hear anything. Then the sounds. Um. Hello, please. Is anyone I'm um, speaking? I lost my network. Um, I'm here, Dami. Are you there so I can ask this question? Yes, I'm okay. All right. So, um, someone asked on the chat section, um, is there like a community where people who contribute to open source are? where one can get someone to help you get started. Oh, okay. So like a community where people contribute to open source are. Uh, I really do not know anyone that's probably centered around people that just contribute to open source rights, but I believe um probably GDS can have something like that. Or maybe like when I was referring to communities, I meant like communities in general. So um I know about um a lot of developer communities like probably GDG Bado, probably the Fortavice community and the likes, but for those that are majorly centered around open source, I actually don't have any idea of any maybe any of the previous speakers that are really, really into open source can probably talk more on that. Okay. Um so to provide more insights regarding um the question that you ask for that um, a community where you can like meet people um, who contribute to open source so that you can probably get someone to help you get started so um it's generally just bringing um different developer communities where you can ask so the first thing you should do yourself is like to ask the question on the group if there's anyone um if, if there's anyone currently um probably participating in an open source program most likely you definitely see maybe a mentor or someone on that group that can help you with that um yeah well let me do you want you wish you had do you have a question please go on Elisa, can you hear me sir i'm here i can go on please so, so um i want to ask a question about the community i think the speaker have already answered the question how to ask uh, so the another issue is like i'm also into flutter where people do say that like, if I say I'm into Flutter, people say yeah, Flutter, Flutter do not have future, do not have future. Though, I've been working on it, but I don't let their work discourage me. 
to I want our hospital to talk. Like, how can I? Because people have not been giving me pregnant, though I'm still giving myself. So, like, if I say flutter, you just easily flutter on your flutter. What is it all about? Like, how do I go about that? Oh, okay. I um allow me to. So I guess like it's probably I'll just probably take that as maybe normal bands that I'll be like, oh, okay, because that doesn't have future, right? I don't really want to talk much about about that, right? But it's one thing I believe in is anything that's worth that's worth doing at all is worth doing well, right? So you started working with Flota. For me personally, I believe that Flota has future because the amount of work the Google team, the Google Flutter team put into the Flota repository, I believe because we work directly with them, and I believe that the, the amount of work they put into it, right, there's a future in Flutter. But since you started with Flutter, I believe it's worth doing well. So just keep on improving yourself in Flutter after building a few apps. And after actually doing it very, very well, you can also, can as well as decide to probably go into other, other tracks. But please, um, avoid jumping from one track to another because if you say there's no feature in front and you drop it halfway, you pick up JavaScript and then somebody tells you that, oh, um, it's not JavaScript is no longer the way if you want to do want to build good this thing or you have to use PHP. You keep jumping around and at the end of the day you might end up just being in uh, what's it called in just one circle and not progressing right. So if you really, really want to improve yourself in Flutter, just make sure build projects, contribute to open source like we said. Join communities. Um, there are a lot of communities. There's even the Flutter community in GDSUI. Join like all of these communities to like improve, improve yourself. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yes, ma. But I'm not like. Can you? I don't know. Maybe there's someone here that um, that into, into that group, like in the GDC, because I am in a platform, so I just saw the link. Okay, this thing is about tech. Let me just join. So I don't know that that. This lecture is all about Flutter stuff and like say I I just saw the link and I just so I don't know maybe how I can get into that group and join the communities. Okay, right. okay. Um for that question I sent a link on the um chat um session now chat panel. Um wait let me correct it. Yeah, so you can I'll make use of that. And it's the link to join um, GDSC UI, so you can make use of that to join. Um, so I have a question personally for the first um, speaker, uh, Mr. Gwadi Hobiro. Um, so I would like you to like um, share more insights regarding your experience um, collaborating with different people on open source projects and how that particular, um, how that in particular has helped you build your network. Yeah. And um, I would also appreciate if other speakers can also um, Answer the question. Yeah. Um, so I'd say in terms of open source collaboration, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to put my thoughts together. I, I, I'd say like we've mentioned different ways of collaborating to open source, aside for contributing to community. And I'd say that was like the that would probably be where I got my biggest takeaway from contributing to open source is actually participating in a community like this one and being active, getting to meet people that have like minds, and then getting to work on really interesting projects together and getting to build something of value. So I'd say, well, for me, I was opportunity to have led. Um, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people here are aware of um, the Open Source Community Africa, Oscar. So Oscar has like chapters all around uh, Nigeria and even outside of Nigeria. So I used to lead an Oscar chapter in Abel Kuta. Um, so I was opportunity to have led that community and it really gave a unique way to actually interact with people, get to organize sessions and but yeah, like not everyone is going to have to like lead a community, but everyone can belong to a community, right? So in terms of getting people to collaborate with uh, on open source projects, the best place to find people is always communities. Always communities. You, like it's going to be very, very difficult for you to be in a community with 100 to 200 people 
and not find one person that has the same or shares similar interests with you. That's going to be very difficult. That is the part where the person is sharing interest with you but is not interested in collaborating on the project. But communities are like where you meet people, they are where you expand, where you go to expand your network. So it's okay to like be a part of the community. It's okay to not be the most active member, but at least when they have like events where there are opportunities for networking sessions, it makes sense to attend these events, if for nothing, for just networking with people. I mean, the person sitting right next to you could be the next person you partner with to work on a project together. Or it could be the person who would fire you for your next job. I mean, I've been affected for community so much that I, I can, off the top of my head, I can list about two, three companies that I have worked for in the past and I didn't get to apply for the role. I only got the role because I met someone from the community who referred me to their boss and all I just did was got on a call with like um the boss it wasn't even an interview it was basically just an introduction really so communities can really go a long way in terms of in, in terms of career growth and contributing to open source they are where you get to like meet people who share similar interests with you and then come up with really interesting ideas and get to like be really interesting stuff together Okay, all right, thank you, um, Gadibo. Um, is there any of your last speakers I'd also like to like add to that? Okay, um, so since we don't have any, um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, okay, um, David, please go on with your question. Good evening, can you hear me? Um, yes, I can. Oh. Um, okay, my question is to the um, first, first speaker. Well, I want to ask about how to um, navigate the GSOC program. I mean, when when you find the, um, the company that suits your, your tech stack or your whatever you want to do, how do you go ahead from there to approach them? Okay, I think that's a great question. Um, so every year, um, organizations apply to organizations apply to Google, and Google reviews these applications. Then approve a set of organization. Then Google release a list of companies that's participating in GSOC for that year. Now there are companies that have like a track a track record of constantly participating, like right? they've been participating for years and they've not missed like any year in a very long time. So if you're interested in participating in GSOC, what I would advise you to do is even before Google, even before organizations start applying to GSOC, right? Look for those companies that have like a track record of participating before. And so for example, let's say you're a JavaScript developer, look for companies that have JavaScript open source project that have participated in GSOC in the last two years, like they participated in GSOC last year, participated in GSOC two years ago, or even three years ago, identify those companies. So you can identify like five or more of them. And then now boil it down to like three companies that you're most interested in. Now those three companies that you're most interested in, just identify those companies, right? Even before they even apply for GSOC that year. Once you've identified those three companies, the first thing you should do is, for the open source projects, they are going to have a, a communication forum. It could be a Slack channel, it could be a Discord server, it could be a, a GitHub discussion. Some of them are agent of this. They use, um, what's it called? Um, this, is, this is very old tool that they use for communication. Um, something RC, I can't remember. It's like very old communication protocol where messages are not even saved online and whatnot. Some of them still use that. A lot of them actually do. So just look for whatever the communication channel is and introduce yourself on their community. Just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Tabor. Um, I'm a JavaScript engineer, blah, 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 blah. I love your open source project so much and I'm anticipating to contribute to it. I'm looking forward to applying to the coming GSOC, whatever, whatever, whatever. That way, you might not know who your prospective mentors are, but they're like seeing communications. 
So then, those three projects, it doesn't make a lot of sense to invest too much time in it. But get familiar with the project. It can be as simple as setting it up on your local machine, understanding their contribution guidelines, or going through like their code structure. If you have questions, ask questions on like their communication channel. Just get familiar with all those projects. When Google announces organizations, if the, the, one of those three organizations gets selected, you can then boil it down to two organizations that you'd like to apply to. I often advise people to apply to more than one organization, right? Um, so just boil it down to like two organizations that you are most interested in and then become a nuisance on their community. When I mean become a nuisance on their community, I don't mean you should go and start disturbing the peace of people or making unnecessary noise. Be curious, ask questions. Other interns, right? By then Google um, announces like the organizations, you see interns start flooding in their community channel. All those interns, they'll have like prospective interns actually, they'll have numerous questions, tons and tons of questions. But because you're already far ahead of them, before the mentors answer the question, answer the questions of other people, provide as much guidance as you can to others. So you, at the back of your mind, don't have it that it's a competition. Have it at the back of your mind that it's a community and we want to grow together you helping others to learn, right? So become very active on the community and teacher channel, ask questions and help others that have questions. Then start contributing code, right? Contribute to their projects. If you can have at least two or three matched pull requests before your final application, it goes a really long way. Because one, it is almost impossible for you to have those pull requests matched without having interacted with who your potential mentor is. You have interacted with them one way or the other. It's often people that are maintaining the project that becomes mentors for those projects. So one way or the other, they already see your activities on the community channel. You can see that you have good communication skills. You can see that you are open to learning. You can see that you are willing to help others and help others grow. And you can also see that you have the necessary skills to contribute to that project because you already have pull requests that you submitted. Then the next phase is actually crafting your application, right? So you have to like spend a lot of time thinking about your application, writing like the application so that it's so good. If possible, in fact, send the draft of your application to the mentor to review and give feedback before you give final submission. A lot of people don't know they can actually submit these applications to mentors. But it all really goes a long way. When you're submitting the application to a mentor, so really like your GSOC, your GSOC application has to be very well and thoroughly thought out. You have to have done a lot of research. Make sure you understand one, the project itself, to understand the problem the project is trying to solve. And when I mean the project is trying to solve, I mean the GSOC of projects, not the open source project, because the open source project might be a very big project, and they just want to, they're just focusing on a very tiny fraction of it for GSOC. So understand the problem is trying to solve, and understand what's the approach the organization is trying to take to solve that problem. So it's a lot of research, a lot of reading, a lot of asking questions. So it's just like you staying constantly curious, establishing like a very strong presence in the community. All of these things can't go unnoticed, really. It just helps you solidify your application and increases your chances of getting selected. And expect Indians, really. I know this is not supposed to be a point, but Indians are like very radical in terms of open source contributions or internships. You find tons and tons of them doing really amazing stuff that you didn't even know was possible. And it can be very intimidating. So I expect like a lot of them, really, like expect a lot of them, right? And really, it's an opportunity for you to grow your network and interact with people outside of your community and like make new friends with people from other parts of the world, understand how the educational system works, collaborate on projects with them. So again, it's not a competition. It's an opportunity for collaborative growth. So yeah, I, I think like just like, few ways in which you can just like solidify your application and all that. Um, thank you very much, Adibo. Um, does that answer the question? Uh, I think it does on, on my side. All right, thank you. Um, so one major key point that I actually took from this was that a uh, majority of the speaker talked about the fact that um, October 1st was like one of the easiest way they had to like, they made use of to like get into open source. So. Um, I shared a link to that on the uh, chat section, so whoever is interested can like go through it, read the guidelines, and um, I think they already have like all of their guidelines um well drafted. 
um, you just need to like um, make four pull requests which they all need to be matched before the deadline so that means you need to like get started early and um, the program itself starts um, um, October 1st um, and runs through um, the last day of October so you can like get started early and um, your what is it called um, your pull request can be as simple as um, making some changes um, on the what is it called on the documentation and um, improving your docs and because majority of um, new views in open source find it very hard very difficult um, to like understand the workflow of projects but um, as the first speaker also made mention of um, when getting started in open source um, it's a thing of um, progressive development so you get started from the very little um, stuff you are starting from so that can be from the documentation um, including the project on your local computer and then navigating through all of these different things and since it is open source um, one of the most important thing you need to like take note of is uh, you yourself need to like understand git and github even our designer in person of um Moibdin Aisha talked about that. So as a designer, you need to have the basic knowledge of Git and GitHub. So that would make it easier for you to like navigate your open source journey. And um, once again, I would like to thank um, all of our speakers, um, Mr. Agbadipo Bilo, um, Ms. Moibdin Aisha, and um, Ms. Ailimi Damilola, as well as all of our participants for attending this session. Um, the different links, um, different resources, um, would be shared to each and every one email that they made use of to register for the session. And um, yeah, that would be the end for this session. Thank you very much for attending. Oh, my system is not there again.